a really important question is, you know, why do you want this job? Yeah, well, um, I really believe that we can build a Washington where everyone has safe, stable, affordable home, quality public education and child care, affordable health care, and we can have safe, thriving communities. I believe we can create an economy in Washington that works for everyone and that creates shared prosperity. I believe that we have to defend justice for all. And I've spent my entire life in public service fighting for those values. And I'd really love to take a collaborative leadership style experience on some of the biggest issues that are facing our community um, and a bold progressive vision to to Olympia to get things done for our district. Well, those are, are great concepts. I don't think you'd find anyone who would uh, who would oppose those, but the, the devil's in the details, as they say. Totally. So in particular, um, one of the several things that you mentioned is, is education. How in the world do we fix that funding? And yeah. Well, first of all, I should say that um, public education is really critical to me. It's a priority. I have two kids in Seattle public schools, and I, I think there are things that we need to do to make sure that our public school system is working for everyone. Um, a few things that the state, I think, can prioritize. One is making sure that there's enough resources invested in our public school system so that we can have well-paid, well-trained teachers. The state has to take action to provide more resources and lift the cap on spe special education funding. Um, that'll really bring some resources and support to our schools to help really meet the needs of more kids. We have a paramount duty to um, support education, and yet we've really viewed public schools too narrowly. And I believe we have to invest in mental health supports and in social workers embedded in our schools and in community partnerships to meet the needs of all kids. So those are a few things that the state can do to really make sure that we're um, building a world-class public education system. Where are we going to get the money, though? Yeah, well, right now we have the most regressive tax system in the country in Washington state. And um, I really believe that we need to fix that and create more of an equitable tax system um, that creates more resources without disproportionately burdening low and moderate income people. And I think that those new resources should be dedicated to priorities like education and child care and basic infrastructure. So what uh, specific new resources? Yeah, well, I think we got to continue. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll uh, finalize and secure capital gains tax. Um, there has been talk about a wealth tax. I'm interested in looking more at the details of that. Um, and uh, other ways of really looking at um, larger corporations and higher incomes. I know we have an income tax in this state, but looking at ways that we can um, really shift to create more equitable tax resources. And I think there are a number of ways to, to look at that, and um, I'm eager to collaborate with others to figure out the best strategies. In either those or, uh, or other areas, um, what are bills that you might be interested in introducing um, if elected? Yeah, so I'm really inter interested in affordable housing, and that's something that I bring deep expertise in. Um, I've spent the last uh, decade working on affordable housing issues, both in local government as the director of the city's Office of Housing, and now nationally at a national nonprofit. And I think there are a few things that we can do. One, um, we need more strategic ways to spend our resources. Um, there have been more resources generated at the state over the last few years for affordable housing, and I think we need a clear vision of what that looks like. I'll bring policies forward to make sure that we're targeting and investing in uh, equitable transit-oriented development, that we're supporting permanent supportive housing, which is what we know is the proven and cost-effective solution to homelessness. Right now, the state does not fund the operations and services for those buildings together with the funds to build the building. And I'd like to create a bill to bring those resources together and better direct the state to invest in a way that can produce housing faster, more efficiently, and really meet the needs in our communities. I also support legislation to make sure that we're creating more housing choices in all communities. 
Um, last year, the bill was known as a missing middle bill, and I'd support that effort to make sure that we have more townhomes and, and moderate and modest housing types that can provide first-time home buyers an opportunity to buy in our communities. Um, I also want to make sure that um, we're supporting low-income homeowners. I think there are bills that can make sure that we're providing both resources and supports to weatherize and uh, repair homes and make sure that people can keep their homes. Uh, anything, though, that you have just standing by, drafted, ready to introduce? Um, I don't have a bill drafted yet, but I think there are a lot of uh, ideas that I've worked on over the years that can get something going really quickly. What of those, though, would be, you know, perhaps if, if, if I had to ask you to, you know, prioritize what you just mentioned, what would be the most absolute burning need if someone said, okay, I can take one of those things that you want to see happen and make it happen first? Yeah, well, um, for me, making sure that the state has a clear way of spending resources to both address our affordable housing and our homeless crisis are a priority. So I would draft and support legislation to better direct funding from the state in a policy-driven way to create affordable housing faster and better to meet the needs of local communities. So that would be like taking the you know, certain amount and saying, okay, you can only spend it for X, X, and Y, or? I think what you do is you, um, you, you draft a bill that basically directs um, the state to fund in certain cases when other things have been met. California's doing this. Um, we've seen this before. Basically, you say, if you're in a transit area, and there have been transit authorities that are providing lower cost land and local government is taking steps to uh, provide faster permitting and better zoning, then the state should show up and fund that housing so we can move forward. And I think that's really creating a partnership between all levels of government to move forward more quickly on affordable housing. We know it's taking too long. We know that we need to move things forward faster. And I think I know the details enough to get that done. You also mentioned um, separate from the, you know, the low income housing necessarily, the, uh, the, you know, the missing middle and whatnot. So do you think that the state needs to ban single family zoning? I think that the state needs to create um, more options in more communities. And right now, what I believe is that um, housing is no longer a local issue only, that our housing crisis crosses uh, communities, that the constraints of housing in some communities impacts neighboring communities, it impacts the region. And so I think the state does need to take action to make sure that we're allowing more housing choices. And I think that they can do that in partnership with local communities. So by in partnership though, not necessarily saying, okay, you guys can't allow single family zoning anymore or anything else restrictive or? Well, I think that there are ways we've seen um, bills out of places like in Massachusetts where beyond low scale density, um, the state in Massachusetts said that near transit, you have to create some kind of higher density multifamily zone. You local community can pick exactly where it is, but you have an obligation to do that. And I think that's a good partnership to move us forward. But we need action from local communities and it's not happening as fast as we need it to happen to address our housing crisis. So I think the state needs to step up. You also mentioned um, something that's, that's of interest to me because we have a fair amount of it around here, um, supportive housing. Yeah. And the fact that the services aren't funded along with the spaces. Yeah. Um, how does that work now then without state assistance? Well, right now, um, you know, for, for many, many decades, we relied on our federal government to create the operating and the services funding to help make permanent supportive housing work. And the feds have not stepped up to the extent that we need them. And so increasingly, the state has taken steps to create more services and operating funding, knowing that Housing First, a supportive housing model works. And now we need to make the, take the next step and increase those resources and drive them together into buildings to create that housing more efficiently. 
Um, you've mentioned repeatedly the, uh, the, the phrase stepped up. Um, obviously, in your career, both as a um, public sector and, and private sector um, in, in housing situations, um, tell me about some of the things that you've done to try to make that stepping up happen. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, when I was the director at the City of Seattle Office of Housing, I was really proud to launch something called a permanent supportive housing pilot. Um, we had historically been creating supportive housing buildings one or two a year. As director, I forwarded an investment to create five, maybe six buildings of supportive housing, tapping new untested partners, partnering with the private sector to create more supportive housing, um, and really creating the connections, investing in new technologies, new ways to build housing so that we can rapidly increase what we know is the proven solution to homelessness. What, that's one thing I was proud to do. Um, at the Office of Housing, I tripled our um, focus and investment in permanently affordable home ownership, using public land to create community land trusts so that first time home buyers who are locked out of the market can create and have an opportunity to buy a home. And um, I, I uh, helped to support the creation on public land of new permanently affordable home ownership, including in the 34th district. Another thing I was proud to work on was a policy called community preference. And I really uh, partnered with community advocates to advance this policy, which is designed to address displacement. We know that so many longstanding residents are having a hard time continuing to afford our communities and are being priced out. And this policy, first of its kind in this area, um, made it so that when there's new affordable housing, there's an opportunity to prioritize people who are from the community or have been priced out, which is an important way to address displacement and advance racial equity. So those are a few ways that I've helped to scale and really push on our solutions. What, uh, what passes for affordable housing, at least when we you know write, write about it, um, given how high the mean income is around here, it seems like still there's not enough, you know, affordable. Is there any sort of redefinition or rechanneling that we can do to, you know, to make affordable that's truly affordable for more people? Yeah, well, I, I think the main issue is that we don't have enough affordable housing solutions. And that's why I think we need to do everything possible, both to create more housing, like the missing middle housing bill, creating more housing options for working families, for middle class families, create more resources to invest in affordable housing that's going to help provide affordable rental places for people who are working in retail or in restaurants or um, in child care or in health care, um, and then continue to scale our solutions for permanent supportive housing for people with disabilities, for um, uh, people on a fixed income, for folks experiencing chronic homelessness so that they, um, they have a safe, stable home as well. It takes lots of solutions and it takes more resources. And I'm excited to bring that comprehensive vision that really looks across the income spectrum to bring more stability and affordability to families and individuals of, of all kinds. We could probably talk for hours about housing. We can. Um, there's a couple other topics yeah. I need to ask about. Um, and one would be public safety. Um, when we report on crime, um, it, it's we, we often have to explain to people that there's a section at which it does, you know, you can talk about judges and police all you want, but the laws are actually made by the legislature. Um, what do you think that uh, is a priority there for you this particular session, if you get elected? Yeah, well, I know there's been, um, over the past few years, um, um, a lot of action and steps taken on public safety. Um, for me, I would approach public safety in a few ways. One, we have to continue to make upstream investments, which make our communities stronger and safer. And um, those are investments like in having a strong and functioning mental health and behavioral health system, including both prevention and crisis response, 
That means investing in housing so that we have people who are living inside and not uh, experiencing visible houselessness or, or poverty in a way that ends up being criminalized. So those upstream investments are really essential to me. Um, also, I think we have to take action on gun reform and we have to continue to move guns off of our streets and reduce the number of guns that are in our communities. We have far too much gun violence happening in the 34th district and across the state. I think we need to continue investments and support of the Office of Firearm Safety and, and, and Gun Violence Prevention. They're investing in community-based solutions that help to prevent gun violence through community response. Um, I think that's critical. And we have to um, find ways to ensure that we have fewer guns on our streets. I support an assault um, uh, assault weapon ban, um, and I support other actions to make sure that we can um, reduce gun violence. That's critical for me. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have to invest in crisis responses that aren't only about a police response. And I think that in doing so, we can have um, our, our police focusing um, more on the crimes in which they need to be responsive to. Uh, and so part of this is about investing in alternative crisis response. I mentioned uh, mental health and behavioral health before. Um, there are some steps and proposals being taken at the county level, and I believe that the state must step up to be a partner in creating meaningful crisis responses. And at the end of the day, we all need to be safe in our communities, and I believe that public safety is important and it's a priority, um, and um, I look forward to collaborating at the state level to see what are the next steps in, in making sure we have safe communities. Besides the um, assault weapon ban, what other specifics do you think could be done to get guns off the streets, have fewer guns on the streets in the first place? Yeah, well, we've made a lot of progress in Washington State over the last few years, so I think we need to continue to build off of that and um, eager to uh, work with experts to figure out what are the next best steps um, on, on gun reform. Uh, we do need a wholesale change in uh, public vision, though, too. And I do think that public education programs and um, investment in community-based uh, uh, violence prevention really do work to help people not resort to purchasing guns as a solution. So look forward to finding out more about what other steps can uh, help make progress on, on reducing the number of guns on our streets. Any particular programs that uh, that have interested you over the years? Yeah, I mean, Choose 180. I mean, there are, um, there are several community-based programs um, uh, uh, that work, and I look at making sure that they're data-driven um, and um, uh, look at the response of what's already been funded by the state office um, and, and see where we need to keep making investments. Um, there are a couple of very specific things in the public safety area. One of them is the um, there's a, uh, a request for legislators to consider repealing or amending the pursuit bill that uh, passed by previous legislators that uh, restricted ways in which police departments can, can pursue. Do you have any uh, opinions on that? Yeah, I, I don't support repealing um, um that change. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's an issue that needs to be revisited from my perspective. Um, we don't, um, the number of pursuits that are happening are minimal. Um, and I think that if we expand options for pursuits, there's too much opportunity to have racial bias and discriminatory policing. So, um, um, that would not be a priority for me. Any uh, particular issues of, um, of, say, sentencing reform or law reform that uh, that, that have attracted your interest? Um, uh, not specifically that I would prioritize immediately. Um, again, I, I um, that's not an area in which I have a lot of expertise, and I look forward to working with others to uh, find out where there can be the biggest change. Um, I, I do want to make sure that... Um, uh, we build, to the extent possible, a more equitable and fair and, um, um, and really dignified 
legal, criminal legal system um, and want to make sure that um, we're investing to the extent possible in diversion programs and, and alternatives to incarceration and that our, um, uh, our carceral system is um, is really made into one that's that's working and that's humane, and I think the best way to do that is to uh, continue with uh, um, supports that really help address the root cause of crimes. But once someone does get into the system, what can be done? to make it a more humane carceral system? Yeah, I mean, I think we need continued partnerships and investments to, um, to support education, um, to address trauma of folks who are incarcerated, um, and, um, and so that there's real and meaningful rehabilitation. And I think that we have to make sure that our people are exiting, that they're not carrying the, the continued burden of being formerly incarcerated. One issue in particular there, going back to my expertise on housing, we continue to have barriers for people who have been arrested or convicted in accessing housing in the market. And we know that when people don't get a home after they leave jail, they're more likely to have recidivism. And so we have to make sure that people can move into safe, stable housing and employment and get back to being productive citizens in our communities and so I'll continue to partner with impacted folks to make sure that we make progress on on having people coming back into community and living um, thriving lives. So uh, so you get elected you get uh, assigned to uh, committees um, besides obviously I'm sure that uh, whatever committee deals with housing is a high priority for yeah. you. Um, what else are you interested in uh, being on? Yeah, well, um, something we haven't talked about yet is uh, a passion of mine is early learning and childcare. And as a working mom, um, I recognize that without uh, affordable, accessible, and reliable childcare, um, working families really struggle. And it's been one of the biggest challenges to having people enter into the workforce. You see that across the board. We have um, real workforce um, uh, shortages in many sectors, in, in nursing and in uh, public sectors and in human services. And not being able to have affordable childcare is named as a reason why people have barriers to entering into the workforce. So I think that we need at the state level to make sure that we're creating more um, operating supports so that child care centers can run well and can grow. We need more investments in creating new child care and early learning facilities. We have a significant shortage of early learning slots across the state. And as a parent in the 34th, I know that's true here. You put your kid on a waiting list for childcare or for early learning, and you in many cases have to wait many years, um, that's not acceptable, and we have to change that. And for working parents who work at non nine to five hours, there are very few options where childcare is accessible. There's also very few options for kids with special needs or um, programs that are culturally competent and provide multilingual supports. So I think one, lowering the cost of childcare, two, creating more facilities statewide, three, making sure that there are operating supports and there are fewer regulatory barriers for early learning providers to operate. And then finally, we know that workers who provide childcare, um, who take care of our children, are some of the most lowest paid workers in the entire state. To, be, to me, that's unacceptable, and I'll prioritize immediately in my first session working to make sure that childcare and early learning workers get a living wage because the more that they stay in tenure in their jobs, that's good for children and it's good for families not to have turnover in providers. So I'd love to partner um, uh, to make childcare and early learning a priority. So is that a minimum wage for child care workers then? Yeah, I mean, I think in some cases it's about increasing um, uh, uh, contracts and subsidies from the state. 
I think it's about looking at who can pay and how much they can pay. Um, it's really a multifaceted approach. And it's about really looking at the regulations that we've put into place also and seeing if they're appropriate to um, for places like in-home daycare providers, whether they're overly burdensome in a way that's limiting options for uh, early learning and childcare growth. What kind of regulation? Certainly you'd want health and safety type rules. Absolutely, and you don't want to undermine health and safety, but we want to make sure that to the extent that there's required training or, um, or required um, uh, uh, documentation or information going back to the state that we're accurately and adequately understanding how much time it takes for providers to do that. And if we need to provide them with more financial support to meet those objectives, then we should do that. But it can't be in and of itself an obstacle to why we're not seeing more child care expansion. So back to the original question, what, yeah. uh, what committee would that be on? Well, the um, Children, uh, Youth, and Families Committee is interesting to me. I know they address a lot of these issues, um, uh, and, and we'll see if that's a place that I can provide support. Uh, another committee that's interesting to me is the capital budget. Um, I've spent, as we've talked about, a lot of time in affordable housing, and affordable housing is infrastructure. In many cases, what I've seen is um, challenges that the state has in really quickly and effectively funding some critical uh, capital projects across the state. Um, I've seen challenges with creating food banks and creating community centers. And um, I'd love to bring a real uh, clarity and vision, as we talked about earlier, about how we can better drive investments in, um, in critical infrastructure and capital projects in the state. So the legislature, all in all, is, is still a part-time body. Yeah, it is. Um, why run for this and not, oh, say, for... City Council next year or, you know, some other, uh, you know, full, more full-time sort of office? Yeah. Well, a few things. Um, one, following Representative Cody's um, retirement, there was an opportunity. And I've thought for many years about um, um, being a public servant as an elected official. And so part of it was an opportunity. Also for me, I've worked on the local government level for many years um, when I worked at the city of Seattle. And I felt that I was able to put many things into place that worked. The supportive housing pilot we did, it worked. Partnership with community around using public land for housing and other community benefits, it worked. And I see an opportunity right now at the state to take what we've seen that works at local level and scale it and fill in the gaps at the state level where we haven't been made, able to make progress in local communities, like on issues like missing middle housing. So I think it's a chance right now to, um, to increase our solutions at the state level. I think particularly on an issue in which I have expertise like on housing, there's a real opportunity to make um, real meaningful progress at the state in a way that hasn't been made before. Uh, what do you think that uh, people should know about that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, um, people should know uh, what we haven't talked about that um, early in my career, uh, I was a Planned Parenthood organizer um, working in southwestern Oregon, fighting for reproductive justice. Um, I worked really um, hard in that, in that position to support reproductive health needs of Latino communities who were being left behind by many conversations about reproductive justice. And at a time right now in our state, um, when we need to defend and expand abortion access and reproductive health care more than ever, I will be a leader and a champion um, on that issue and really bring focus to making sure that as we see an increase of people coming from out of state to seek abortion care in this state, that we're stepping up and we're creating meaningful access for all people. So that's a priority for me. Um, People should also know um, that I love living in this community. 
I'm so deeply grateful that I get to raise my kids here and that I get to um, support the small businesses and enjoy the natural beauty of our community. And what I hope to do as an elected official is fight for um, thriving communities for all people, to have all people be able to um, live in the 34th in a way that's dignified personally for themselves and um, to make their family thrive and to support um, a continued um, uh, uh, protection of our environment so that we can have um, um, we can really live in a, a thriving, healthy community for years to come. Great. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you so much, Tracy.